Good evening, and thank you all so much for being here on behalf of Jennifer Rabb, the president of Hunter College, and Harold Halsner, the director of Roosevelt House. We are all very excited this evening to have the honor of Peter Schinkel's presence. I direct the LGBTQ Center here at Hunter, but I also have a side gig of reviewing books for The Guardian, and I review about 20 a year, and I can say without reservation that this book by Peter was the most astonishing one that I got to review last year. And as a gay historian, I have to admit that I was quite startled that there was this huge story which had never been told before about a gay triangle at the center of Dwight D. Eisenhower's White House. And also, I was of course very familiar with the fact that one of the first things that Dwight Eisenhower did when he became president was to issue a disastrous executive order which banned gay people not only from employment by all federal agencies but by all federal contractors and this in turn ruined the lives of thousands of people. We showed a movie here last fall which describes what happened called The Lavender Scare and if you haven't seen it when it comes to the theaters in June, which it will, you should go out and see The Lavender Scare made by Josh Howard. It's a great movie but even Josh was not aware of the story at the center of Peter's book. Peter was for 19 years in the news business, most recently for the St. Louis Post-Dispatch. He covered the federal courts. He did a variety of investigative stories, and he is the great nephew of the book's subject, Robert Cutler, and he has just moved recently with his wife, Marguerite, to Portsmouth, Rhode Island. And we're going to start this evening by showing you a little clip so that you will see two of the three people in this uh, gay triangle inside Dwight D. Eisenhower's White House. There's Lefty Lush. Assistant Senator Jim Duff of Pennsylvania. Candidate Eisenhower leaves the campaign special for a whistle-stop tour in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. These are members of the candidate's campaign staff milling around the campaign special. There's Walt Kwan, air transportation specialist, with Mrs. Fred Seaton, Fred Seaton and Mrs. Schwann standing around there. Steve Benedict, Gabe Haugie, Mrs. Adams, Mrs. Seaton, Mr. Seaton, Stu Newland of the press section. Governor Sherman Adams, Chief Eisenhower aide with General Robert Cutler. And the back platform is Dr. Gabe Haugie and General Cutler with the photographer who takes a short rest. General Eisenhower returns from his Was the Campaign special and they're off to other parts. Peter, why don't you start by telling us a little bit about this man, Bobby Cutler, and what he did before he became part of the Eisenhower White House. Well, Robert Cutler um, grew up in Boston. He was born in 1895. He was one of five brothers, all of whom went to Harvard. Um, he was the baby. Um, and in the class of 1916 of Har at Harvard, he was the class poet. Um, he also um, gave an exhortation to the class to, at the, in speaking to uh, encourage them to uh, defend the nation to take their military duty and to uh, be good citizens. Um, so he was very patriotic uh, uh, from the start, from the get-go. They were all Republicans, um, and they were uh, fierce patriots. So um, Bobby uh, enlisted through the Plattsburgh movement in Plattsburgh, New York, took his military training, served in World War I, came back um, and uh, went to Harvard Law, uh, was, on, was one of the editors of the Harvard Law Review, uh, had a successful law career in Boston. And then he uh, became friends with Henry Cabot Lodge, um, a young Republican, son of the famous Senator Henry Cabot Lodge. So it was Henry Cabot Lodge Jr. A grandson, I should say. Um, and he's, he's the one who becomes ambassador to the UN eventually, right? That's correct. Right. 
and Ab ambassador to Vietnam under right. President Kennedy. Um, and he, and uh, Bobby helped him uh, win election in 1936 to U.S. Senate. And this sort of charted a career of getting involved in electoral politics. But he also was one of those Republicans who could work across the aisle. And in Boston, he eventually um, uh, became friends with um, Maurice Tobin, who was a reformist Democrat, and helped Mayor Tobin win election uh, in 1940, and then was appointed um, corporate counsel to the city of Boston. And this ability to work across the aisle um, endeavor, uh, endeared Bobby to Democrats, and he soon found himself working in the War Department under President Roosevelt, beginning in 1942. And um, eventually he got to know Dwight D. Eisenhower toward the end of the war and became friends with Ike. And uh, along with Henry Cabot Lodge was among those people who began to uh, encourage Ike um, in 1952 to run for president. At that time, Ike was still in the US military and he couldn't declare overtly so there was lots of uh, communications behind the scene. Um, but eventually, Bobby wound it up on the campaign, as you see here. Um, in the, in the post-year wars, by the way, he'd been um, president of uh, the largest trust company um, outside of New York in the United States, Old Colony Trust in, in Boston. Um, and uh, so that also contributed to the many uh, contacts that he, that he had, that he brought with him to the White House eventually uh, after Ike won election in the fall of 1952. But he's a very complicated guy. He also, let's talk a little bit about his theatrical career in college or after college. <laughs> right. Yeah, he was a member of what's called the Tavern Club. A, 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 it's a unique uh, organization, really, the Tavern Club in Boston. It's very... Uh, a lot of, it, it brings together businessmen and artists and writers and, uh, it was a, and they would per perform their own plays on the third floor of the club right near the common. And um, it's an extraordinary thing. Well, a lot of these plays, uh, it was an all-male club, so continuing the traditions that many of these men had from Harvard, the men would dress up as women. Um, and he mostly played the female parts, didn't he? He did, and he seemed to enjoy it. And his, his uh, dear friend, Owen Wister, um, who was a close friend of President Teddy Roosevelt's, uh, so he was a generation older, um, cast um, uh, Bobby in, a, in an operetta in which he played the love interest, uh, Zoe Moo, as, as she was called. And it, it just, he, he certainly enjoyed cross-dressing, something he later uh, disclosed in his own, di in his own biography, right. autobiography. Right. Um, so, uh, it does seem that he was exploring sexual orientation from a young age, and, um, and it does seem like many of the people he knew thought that he was probably gay, didn't they? Certainly those who knew him on, on a personal level, yeah. but most of the people who knew him believe that in, in a professional life, he was all business all the time. But after hours, if you had a drink with him or you just socialized in any manner, little things would slip, and he would let them slip. He, 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 would, he wouldn't mind if there was some hint. Um, and many people concluded that he was gay from those interactions. Um, but I, one of the questions that comes up is, did Ike or any of the other associates know that Bobby was gay? And um, uh, there's no record of that. And, and um, but I think it would be fair to assume that Ike um, probably had a, a good sense that he was, particularly because they spent a lot of time together during the campaign, in the train, um, and um, there, there's a lot of time outside of just campaign work. And um, it, my personal belief is that Ike sort of knew without knowing I mean, there also were a lot of rumors that followed Bobby. Um, so um, I probably heard some of those rumors. But he was probably comfortable that Bobby was so good at his job that he was not going to object to him on the as, grounds of his sexual orientation. you say in one of my favorite paragraphs of the book, it was such a strange time to be gay in America in the 1950s. And Peter writes, 
homosexuality was simultaneously everywhere but nowhere, suspected but not proved, concealed but then revealed, loathed and labeled a security risk but then giggled about. Amid it all, from deep inside the White House, Bobby and Skip were doing their best to serve President Eisenhower and fight communism. So why don't you tell us a little bit about the other two gay people who were in the White House at the same time as Bobby? Certainly. Well, uh, one of them you <clears throat> saw in the picture very briefly was Steve Benedict. And um, uh, Steve had grown up in New York and was a very fine classical pianist. He'd gone to St. John's. He um, uh, Then he went over to Europe. He, he was actually interested in world federalism, which in those days was viewed as something akin to communism. Uh, <laughs> but he went over to Europe, and um, there he met a young man named Skip Coons. And Skip was a very interesting young man. Uh, he'd grown up in Plainfield, New Jersey, and he um, entered the Naval Language School um, at the age of 17, I believe, in, in Colorado. He, became, he learned Russian, became a Russian translator, um, then moved into intelligence and worked in the Navy, or was an intelligence operative for the U.S. Navy um, after... Um, uh, the end of the war, and in fact was translated for U.S. forces during one of the most remarkable um, uh, early Cold War conflicts in which a U.S. Uh, naval vessel um, sailed into the port of Dairen, China, and was ordered to leave within 48 hours. And Skip was the only person translating the uh, heated commands from the Russian command from the Russian uh, forces in the port to the um, to the American vessel um, and that was at the age of 20 by the way this is extraordinary young man he then went on graduated from Princeton was doing um, uh, doctorate work in Paris w when he met S Steve okay so Steve and Skip <laughs> they fall in love they they um, have a, 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 a. They live together. They live in the south of France. They live in Paris. Eventually, Steve comes back and winds up on the campaign. Skip, meanwhile, um, goes to work for Amcom Lib, which is a CIA front that is establishing anti-Soviet programming um, in based in Munich. Um, so radio uh, programming. Radio programming. Right. Thank you. Yes, and so. Um, after the election, Bobby uh, Steve tells Bobby, "You've got to hire this guy. He's, he's a great, he's brilliant, meaning his former lover." Um, now, of course, he doesn't describe him as such. Um, and Bobby says he sounds fantastic and hires him sight unseen to work on the staff of the NSC, the National Security Council. So, uh, and Bobby himself is pretty much the first. Does he have not quite the title of national? So what is his title? Um, uh, Special Assistant for National Security Affairs. Right. The national security advisor position that we all know no. today, John Bolton's current holder of that post, um, is actually technically called Special Assistant for National Security Affairs. Its casual name or secondary name is National Security Advisor. Right. So, and Bobby was pretty much the first one to have this job, right? That's correct, because Bobby had actually worked uh, for President Truman on the Psychological Strategy Board, and he had seen the utter dysfunction that was happening in establishing national security policy under President Truman. And so he began talking to Ike about that during the campaign, wrote some speeches. Ike actually turned dysfunction on the, of the National Security Council into a campaign issue in 1952. Um, and um, so, and when does he fall in love with his new employee? <laughs> <laughs> well, it, it suggested that it happens almost immediately, yeah. but he doesn't let it out. He doesn't show it, but he's smitten from the get-go. But um, ultimately, it would be another five years before Bobby really expresses his profound love and starts writing a diary about Skip which Steve ultimately turned over to me about 10 and years how ago. How long was that diary? This is one of the great archival discoveries <laughs> of all time. How long? How long? Uh, six, six volumes, six handwritten volumes, yeah. 
About 125,000 words. And it's basically a 125,000 word love letter to him, right? It is, although <laughs> there's a time there when in about 1958, Bobby becomes infatuated with Steve's, uh, excuse me, with Skip's lover, Gail, Gaylord Hofteaser. And so there's a few chapters of the diary go to Gail, <laughs> but otherwise it's all Skip all the time. So, yeah. Um, but the fascinating thing about Bobby Cutler is that it, it's not just the hidden love story. It is, the, it is the story of the remaking of the National Security Council into the preeminent tool for protecting national security in the United States. Um, President Truman had largely neglected the National Security Council, um, although that changed swiftly after uh, the outbreak of the Korean War in June of 1952, but still Truman didn't really use it to its full potential. Ike, on the other hand, had seen the proper function of a military staff and how you, you understand threats and your resources and, and how a open, vigorous debate in a council like that is a critical tool for national security. And, uh, and that was Bobby's vision as well. Um, so in March of 1953, two months in the office, Bobby wrote a 20-page paper saying this is how we're gonna make, this is we're gonna recreate this agency, we're gonna create this position um, which is Special Assistant for National Security Affairs. He's going to set the agenda for the meetings. He's going to brief the president before the meetings. And I'm using the word he, but there's no reason it needs to be a he. I should correct myself on that. But the, um, and, and I uh, immediately signs the paper within two days, says, let's do it. And a few days later, he says, oh, yeah, and you're the National Security Advisor. And, um, and after that, the, you know, the, they increased the staffing and began developing a more profound study of the issues. Um, and they built a very um, an, um, an incredibly efficient um, organization for understanding the threats that were facing the nation. And they were many, of course. Um, uh, Stalin's Soviet Union was threatening and taking over other countries, and um, the, the uh, nuclear arms race was exploding. Um, so they had a lot of issues to deal with, and uh, Bobby was very much responsible for um, leading that effort for Ike. Now, the 1950s, as we know, is a period of backlash against homosexuals, and you have an interesting theory about which two books in 1948 may have helped to stimulate this backlash. What are they? Yes, well that is, uh, first off, the Kinsey Report, um, uh, who, led by Alfred Kinsey and um, exploring um, human, the sexual behavior in the human male and, and um, revealing. And one third of all American men have had sex with a man after puberty, right? Yes. Basically. Which is a gigantic headline in America in 1948. Yes. <laughs> Yes, uh, and the other, of course, was um, Gore Vidal's City and the Pillar, also published in 1948, which told the story of um, anonymous gay sex, um, Hollywood movie stars uh, who were gay but pretending to be hetero, um, introduced the word queen. It's um, really, it's the first modern novel which sort of gives you a peek at the secret gay life that had been going on all along. Yes, and it, it also places the gay experience on a spectrum of, of um, that's, you know, I, I, close to what you would call normalcy. Right. You know, it's right. a human experience that you can see. It's not just some criminal experience that happens right. in dark and, and, you know, results in, a, in an arrest. It's actually, these are, he describes the experiences of, of um, young men and, and, how they fall in love and their passions and and um, and of course uh, anonymous sex as well. It's it's all there. He's not hiding anything. He's not uh, painting it too in too rosy a manner, but it really exposes the reality of gay life. And um, and so and so then we get Joe McCarthy and Roy Cohn, who are not only investigating communists in the government but also uh, 
homosexuals and describe the process by which this executive order comes to be. It's sent over by, the uh, draft is sent over originally by the Attorney General, is that the way it began? Well, what happens is the Attorney General says, let's issue a, a security order um, for federal employees. And, the, and the, the impetus for this was that Ike had uh, uh, fostered a relationship with Joseph McCarthy, the caustic, red-hunting senator from Wisconsin. Um, but he wanted McCarthy's votes to win the election. He wanted McCarthy's supporters to vote him, to, to su vote for him. And so um, in October of 1953, um, he invited McCarthy onto the campaign train when it was in Wisconsin. 53, 52. Uh, 52, excuse 52, me, 52, thank right. you. Um, and they appeared on the back of the train. And um, shortly thereafter, um, McCarthy um, spoke in support of Ike and said he's going to be the best thing for America. And um, I think that it, you can't, it was not a, a full embrace because I think Ike had also objected heartily, for example, to McCarthy's attack on General Marshall whom he revered, right. and um, he also said, I don't agree with McCarthy's tactics, but what I do agree is that we need to get subversives out of the American government. So he embraced, in order to get the McCarthy voter, he embraced McCarthy's message that there were right. too many subversives in America. And so, um, in many ways, in fulfillment of a campaign pledge, um, Ike and his team moved to develop a, a, a tightening of security rules for federal employees. And the Attorney General recommended proceeding quickly with an order just a couple pages in length that was drafted, a press release was prepared, it was ready to go out in January. Um, but Bobby spoke up and said, well, the Truman Administration has already prepared a revision of the security rules. And it's been through the process. It's been examined by different intergovernmental, interdepartment committees. And therefore, as a good lawyer, he thinks it's process, right? So it, it must be OK if it's been looked at by lots of different people. Um, and he says, let's use that. So he, he, he recommends that. And it goes under consideration for And that's months. the one which concludes the, the, the part about homosexuals, unlike the one that was prepared by Eisenhower's attorney general? Correct. Correct. So now, I, I caution, I rush to say that we have no document saying what Bobby Cutler was thinking about that provision, which uses the term sexual perversion. By the way, that's the term they use, sexual perversion. Um, th what the way it's laid out is that it says that um, every employee coming to the government must be investigated whether they pose a security risk. Things that can, con be, can constitute a security risk are drunkenness, deceitfulness, crime, sexual perversion, um, alcohol addiction. Um, so it kind of leaves it open. It's to, it doesn't, you know, it's, it's, it's a, I call it the pe a peculiar ban because it, it doesn't say anyone who's a sexual pervert can't be in federal, in federal office. It just says you should investigate whether they have one of these conditions and consider whether they are. Well, but are. the effect was that anybody who had any evidence of and having had any homosexual activity was driven out of the government. Exactly correct. Right. In fact, in the State Department, you had um, uh, Foster Dulles, the Secretary of State, had uh, put in uh, one of Joe McCarthy's top allies as his security chief. Right and they created something called the miscellaneous M unit, which began to just hunt for homosexuals. I mean, they would take communists too, and, and did, probably, uh, although identifying them is virtually impossible. But um, the, um, so it, it is peculiar. It's also peculiar because we don't know what Robert Cutler was thinking when he recommended that. We don't really know what Ike was thinking there's very little discussion why, what is sexual perversion not defined in the executive right. order? Sexual perversion today is something very different 
from sexual perversion then, right? <laughs> um, sexual perversion then meant one thing, gay people. Yeah. Yeah, but, let's talk about that code clerk who gets arrested when? In 1957, is it? And he, that's when Cutler is under the greatest stress of perhaps being revealed, right? That's correct. Let's talk about how that one went. So um, in 1957, a White House clerk was uh, picked up trying to make a connection, a, a, a gay sex anonymous connection in the George Washington University bathroom. And um, the Secret Service is called in and um, he tells the Secret Service that Bobby Cutler's gay, he's sure of it, and he's been taking, uh, he's been working with Bobby Cutler, and if he keeps working with Bobby Cutler, he's sure that it's gonna really embarrass the White House. Why he's telling them all this, no one really knows, but he does. Um, and uh, Well, people were certainly pressured to tell, to give the names of anybody else they knew who was gay when uh, they were arrested. Uh, absolutely, yeah. yes, and that's certainly what he did. He also identified two of his fellow employees in the White House. Um, and, um, and did they get fired, the fellow employees? I can't remember. They, they all lost their jobs. But not Bobby. Not Bobby. And what was that strange letter that, that Hoover writes to him that has this weird implication that Hoover knows? Right, so the way they, they Hoover gets involved is that um, uh, Joseph Halter, the, the, original employee, the original person named, um, tells uh, the Secret Service that um, he had seen a letter identifying uh, Anthony Eden um, uh, uh, as a homosexual. Anthony Eden was the English Prime Minister. Um, and so Sherman Adams, Eisenhower's chief of staff, is made aware of this. And he's concerned that there's a security breach because he's seen a letter of some kind asserted, making this assertion. So J. Edgar Hoover is called in. Hoover rushes to the White House and immediately questions people about what's going on. Um, he questions Bobby. Um, um, Bobby doesn't know what letter this is. Hoover goes back to the FBI, looks through his files, realizes that it's a letter that he himself, Hoover, had written to Bobby in 1953, four years earlier, identifying Eden, who was then Foreign Secretary, right. not Prime Minister, right. Foreign Secretary, as, as a homosexual. Uh, um, so. <clears throat> um, no, but then there's that letter when he's reappointed, when Cutler leaves, he leaves the White House before the 56 campaign, maybe because he's nervous about being identified as gay, right? So that's another FBI investigation right. that uh, J. Edgar Hoover is well aware of, um, where um, uh, William Bullitt, the former U.S. ambassador to the Soviet Union, um, uh, identifies Bobby as gay and says that there are rumors running wild in Washington that he's gay. So Bobby is actually the first and the fourth national security advisor of the United States because in uh, April of 55, so um, two and a quarter years into the first administration, he steps down and he goes back to Boston. Maybe out of nervousness that this will be revealed in the 56 campaign, right? That's, that's the operative theory. He claims he's just exhausted, right. and he may well have been exhausted. He probably was exhausted also because he was known to be an extremely hard worker. Um, so he steps down and um, eventually, in, after the Ike wins re-election in 56, he comes back into office. Ike says, I want you back. He starts in January, first week of January 1957 in Eisenhower's second term. So he's the fourth secretary. And is that president. when Hoover writes him this strange letter? I'm trying to remember. There was something about the salutation in the letter, wasn't there? Oh, yes, right. <laughs> yeah, that, he says, uh, he calls him Bobby, and he writes it B-O-B-B-I-E. Right. And, and, <laughs> and then, and Bobby replies back, um, and he underlies the correct spelling of his name. <laughs> 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 he, uh, and so he's, Freudian slip or intentional 
attempt to tell him I know the truth. Exactly. And he also sends it on a, Bobby sends his reply on a letter for the bank that he worked for, the old colony trust. And it's got a picture of a pilgrim, you know, with one of those black wide brim hats. And, and uh, their logo is uh, worthy of your trust. <laughs> So, um, but to finish the story about Hoover's investigation of Bobby, I will say that it's really quite extraordinary. So Hoover identifies the letter that this young gay man apparently saw. Um, and, uh, and meanwhile, by the way, the three young gay men are all dismissed from the White House quietly, and it never makes it into the media. Uh, if it had, you can imagine it would have been a completely outrageous scandal. Um, yeah, it's kind of amazing it never did. Yeah, especially because Hoover shared so much information with McCarthy. I mean, they were like that. Um, so, uh, but then Hoover, uh, just three weeks later, he's investigating, trying to figure out, get to the bottom of what's happening here. And then he just reports, our investigation couldn't find anything. The matter's closed. So, now, Hoover, of course, was widely suspected of being gay. And I don't set out in my book to answer the question of whether Hoover's gay because people have read, written vast volumes on that. There's lots of evidence to support it. He was it. clearly in love with his deputy. Whether they actually did it or not is one of those things that's <laughs> hidden from history, I always say, because J. Edgar Hoover had the only house that was definitely not bugged by the FBI. <laughs> <laughs> the thing I find most intriguing about their relationship is that, that Hoover took pictures of Clyde Tolson, the associate director, sleeping. <laughs> <laughs> I just find and that they so vacationed together. They did everything they together. They ate together. They, they drove they together to work. They drove home together. They lived around the corner from each other. And Clyde inherited everything uh, in uh, J. Edgar's estate, of course. When yeah. they did that. But did so they, uh, Powers, uh, Richard Gid Powers, who did one of the definitive biographies, says it was clearly a spousal relationship, but whether or not it was sexual, we don't really know. Yeah, I think that's fair. So the, the, the interesting thing is, well, what is, so Hoover needed Bobby because as National Security Advisor, he was in many ways the pipeline to the president. Hoover also could not attack Bobby because if he attacked the president's right-hand man, the president could get extremely unhappy with you. So my belief is that... You think Eisenhower was less afraid of Hoover than certain other presidents? That's a good question. I don't know. I, I don't know. Really that I think he, I, I would never, I would not classify Ike in any way as afraid of him. So if you... If yeah, well then, yeah. <laughs> so so maybe that answers yeah. the question. Yeah. I mean, I think he was, um, you know, he, for example, when Charles Bolin um, his nominee to be ambassador to Moscow was slandered by McCarthy as smeared as gay. Um, Which he was not. We don't think he was. We, right? we don't think he was. I and mean, there's no evidence that right. he was. It was just a smear because he didn't like the fact that Bolin had been translator for Roosevelt at Yalta and had, you know, a, a long association with the Roosevelt administration and Truman administrations. But he just wanted to attack him. And... Um, and when, he, uh, when that matter came up early in the Truman administration in 1953, um, Ike ordered Hoover to show the investigative file on Bolin to two U.S. senators, one Democrat and one Republican. And that was the breaking point in which the U.S. Senate rejected McCarthy's attack on Bolin and, con and to confirm right, Bolin. Right. So I think I, I wasn't going to take anything off uh, uh, um, uh, Hoover. There are two things you need to know that we haven't mentioned. First, that Peter is the great nephew of his subject, Bobby Cutler, and learned about his sexuality from your aunt? From who? When you my aunt and my mother. Right. Yes. <laughs> Um, and uh, the other thing is, this is not just a book about gay life in the White House. It's also a book about everything else that Bobby Cutler did as National Security Advisor. So the coup in Guatemala, the coup in Iran, he does them all. This book has everything about the foreign policy, the Eisenhower administration, and it is fascinating. And we will take questions from the audience. Wait for the microphone, which is coming right up. 
Yeah, go ahead. Was there any indication of what relationship Vice President Nixon might have had with Cutler? Yes. Um, well, their relationship really began during the campaign of 52 when uh, it emerged that Nixon had been collecting uh, funds uh, through a campaign fund created by wealthy donors in California. Uh, this ultimately led to the checkers speech. But in the interim, on the campaign train, um, Bobby quickly worked with Ike to try to resolve this and, and um, they thought about bringing in a Supreme Court justice to investigate it. And um, Bobby seemed to edge closely, close toward dumping Nixon. I mean, Ike was close. It was, it was questioned whether he was going to take him all the way through the campaign. And that sort of began the relationship. However, in the ensuing years, um, uh, Bobby had a fairly cordial relationship with Nixon. Um, uh, they didn't, even though Nixon had a history of, of being a communist hunter himself, um, they, uh, Nixon never appeared to go after Bobby. Um, they traded postcards on vacation. It was a fairly friendly relationship. So, but there's no real clash between the two men that I could see. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you for a wonderful talk. Uh, how much longer did Bobby stay with Ike in the second time he went back? Um, he, he ultimately left office in July of 58. Um, so that was a year and a half. Um, and um, and which the, what were the pills he was taking to keep a, stay awake <laughs> and go to sleep every day? <laughs> he, was, uh, he was again exhausted. He also, uh, in, late in his term, had uh, made an almost single-handed push to uh, make a dramatic change in U.S. nuclear strategy. Um, which I describe at length in the book. Basically, he he thought that uh, the rat he he had he had worked with uh, Robert Oppenheimer in 1953, to and brought Oppenheimer into the National Security Council to talk about the risk of nuclear weapons and the importance of openness with the American public about nuclear weapons. I think it's quite clear that Bobby shared those concerns, and. Um, Eventually, those ideas, I think, built into a phenomenal degree of concern that he had about the buildup of nuclear weapons. He believed that it would be possible to build far fewer weapons and still maintain a deterrent. Um, but his plan called for targeting cities instead of only military establishments, um, a very controversial plan. Um, he, he reckoned that most nuclear weapons, many, nucle many military facilities were already in cities, so in effect we were targeting cities already. Um, and also that uh, the power of nuclear weapons was so extraordinary uh, that you just didn't need so many for um, a deterrent. And so ultimately, however, there's a major national security meeting in, uh, national security council meeting in <clears throat> May of 58, uh, at which uh, there was a very robust debate, and uh, the Army sided with Bobby, but the Air Force uh, objected to it, and the Chief of Staff, uh, Nathan Twining, also objected to it, and the, the idea died. And so there wouldn't be a substantial reduction in um, nuclear weapons manufacturing or construction in the United States for another 30 years. Um, until uh, the intermediate nuclear facilities, uh, intermediate nuclear uh, IMF forces, thank you, um, Internuclear, intermediate nuclear forces treaty uh, signed by President Reagan, which of course is now, uh, President Trump is pulling us out of because he thinks the, tr the Russians are violating it. but. Uh, so, and in some, your question was how much longer was he in there? I've kind of taken you down the rabbit hole here, but uh, he, he left after about uh, another 18 months. Um, the reasons for that are, appear to be that he was exhausted. Um, he was taking uppers and downers, wasn't he? He was, he was. Um, 
Dexamil and, and other drugs that were legal at the time, but he seemed to take them on a regular basis. But it also at that time, uh, Skip had moved to Paris, and um, his love for Skip had blossomed in, in July of 57. After the scare of the investigation in the White House, which Hoover dropped, Bobby um, basically fell head over heels in love with Skip and began keeping the diary. And um, however, Skip moved to Paris, began to work in the US Embassy. Um, what exactly drove Bobby's retirement in July of 58 is unclear. It's probably some combination of exhaustion and infatuation with Skip, um, but he was there about 18 months. Excuse me. Uh, since you had mentioned uh, Guatemala and Iran, could you speak a little bit about um, uh, Bobby's relationship with Alan Dulles and the CIA, and then secondarily with John Foster Dulles and State? Sure. So, um, uh, Bobby was uh, friendly with both men, but um, he also um, shared concerns um, raised by a number of critics that, that uh, Alan Dulles, the CIA director, was um, out of control and, and uh, running a lot of programs that might cause great embarrassment and great problems for the president. Um, so among other things uh, that Bobby did was to um, uh, require or, or um, cre help create a policy that required that uh, Alan Dulles come and report to the president on his activities on a regular basis and to stand, uh, stand on that and ensure that he did. Um, <clears throat> but ultimately, um, uh, when it comes to, for example, the Iran coup, um, uh, Bobby, in the early phase, that was in, in August of 53, so the first year of the Eisenhower administration. Um, uh, there were a fair number of discussions in the National Security Council, and Bobby recommended considering a path um, that would separate U.S. policy from Great Britain's. Uh, what started the Iran coup was that uh, Iran, under Premier Mossadegh, had nationalized the Anglo-Iranian oil company, and the Brits wanted it back, basically, was what it came down to. President Truman had steered a neutral path and had, had refused to take, take stands, and Ike, when he first came in, said he would do that. Um, and in some of the early National Security Council meetings, um, Bobby recommended that the U.S. Uh, take a, a separate path from the Brits and perhaps contemplate something like even buying the Anglo-Iranian assets and creating a company out of them. Um, how that exactly would work is really unclear. Ultimately, um, Allen and his brother Foster Dulles at State um, uh, organized a coup that came very close to failing but succeeded in, in uh, 53. Um, but Bobby was friendly with, with both men. They were cordial, um, but it was not a close relationship. They were clearly on, on a, a, a more aggressive, anti-Soviet, um, uh, strategic approach. Um, Ike, was, uh, Ike shared some of that. But he also um, didn't want the United States to enter into wars. He was uh, very much interested in keeping America out of wars. So Bobby kind of tread, trod that path of helping keep those two guys in line, uh, but helping Ike, because that was his job. What Bobby saw his role was to help Ike create what he wanted out of US policy. So, um, if Ike's message to Bobby was, look, well, let's work with Alan and John, help me do that, then Bobby's role was to make sure that those two guys reported into him properly, that he knew what was going on and had his finger on the pulse. And what about the impact of Bobby with the They are, yes. They are at the Eisenhower Library. Um, and uh, regarding Kimoy and Matsu, um, 
Bobby's in, involvement in that discussion is, is quite limited. Um, uh, he does get uh, briefly involved in discussions about, for example, whether a nuclear bomb should be used in Vietnam, um, uh, which involved President Nixon. Um, you know, ultimately, uh, Ike. In what period is that? Which was '54. Oh, so Ike. Ike throws around, you know, willingness to use nuclear bombs, nuclear weapons, in a number of cases, um, but it's often in internal private meetings. You, it's almost as if because he also says later that he never would want to use the bomb, so he kind of plays it both ways, and it's almost like he's trying to gauge the response of his his staff when he when he uses those words. But uh, regarding Kimoi and Matsu, the, the uh, islands there near Formosa, Bobby's involvement was very tangential. Um, yes? Were there any stories that you were able to find out that you revealed back to your mother or to your aunt that they were unaware of? Hmm. <laughs> well, um, <coughs> Neither of them was aware uh, of, of at all of of uh, Steve Benedict or Skip Coons. What they did know was that um, in later years, in particular the '60s, that Bobby would often come to family events and he'd have a man there who was 30 or 40 years his junior, and this made them a little uncomfortable. <laughs> that was the extent of their understanding of, of Bobby's sexual orientation. So it's, it's fair to say that pretty much the whole book, apart from the stuff about the Cutler family, it was all new to them. Um, so, um, although... You want to show us the people that were talking yeah, about? Yeah, let's take a look at a few slides here. Uh, this is Bobby. Bobby Cutler at age two in Brookline. <laughs> uh, Bobby at about age 12 or so at Volkman School in Boston, preparing for a dramatic performance. He loved the stage. And this is a, a picture that emerged from the files of Steve Benedict. Uh, when I first met Steve, uh, 13 years ago, no, I guess it was 11 years ago now, <laughs> sorry. Uh, I, um, I went to, to see him in upstate New York and he, he said, well, I've got a bunch of pictures and these pictures had come from um, his friend, Skip's estate. So Steve had maintained a close relationship with Skip through all the years and Bobby had evidently given lots of documents to Skip have we here? So we have Bobby on the left and a mystery man on the right. It says June 1st, 1914. That would be Bobby would be about 18 years old. I spent many hours trying to figure out who this young man is. Um, I know, for example, I even went, he has an injured hand of some kind, right? It's in a kind of a homespun cast. Um, I could never figure out who that was. Bobby does leave hints in his writing that he had passionate relationships with young men in his youth. This is Bobby at uh, Plattsburgh, uh, the uh, military training for World War I. For World War I near Plattsburgh, New York. Bobby's here on the right. Bobby with the Harvard Law Review, um, class of 1922. This is my grandfather, uh, or sorry, great grandfather, George Cutler, and his five sons Elliot, Roger, uh, John, my grandfather, Bobby, and Roger. Uh, that's George, excuse me, Roger. <laughs> Anyway, um, you can see that, uh, uh, let's see, they're not in the birth order in this one for some reason, but <laughs> they often lined up in birth order. Um, 
So there's Bobby with Mayor Maurice Tobin of Boston on the left. It'd be about 1939 or 40. Bobby got to know the Tobins by working with the community chest in Boston, um, helping raising funds, and uh, became very close with Mayor Tobin and his wife, went on vacations with them, um, so we're very fond of each other. And my father worked for Tobin when he became his, when Tobin became Secretary of Labor, my father worked for him as Assistant Secretary of Labor. So we have another funny connection. <laughs> so this is a photograph of Bobby uh, on, a, on a trip in the Caribbean with Senator Harry, Henry Cabot Lodge. <laughs> um, Cabot Lodge's wife and her sister. And this is Chen Bigelow who was a very, very close friend of Bobby's for many years. Bobby's having a ball. Chan's not really enjoying this scene at all. Um, but um, it, it is. How do we explain Bobby's attire in this? Well, I think it was a, uh, uh, some kind of costume party. <laughs> but um, again, he did have a certain fondness for cross-dressing. So, as I mentioned, Bobby served in, World, in the War Department during World War II. This is Secretary of War Henry Stimson on the left, um, a, a, a word, awarding Bobby uh, the Distinguished Service Medal in 1945. Um, among the most extraordinary, uh, or the most interesting things Bobby did in the War Department was to manage the soldier voting uh, in, in the election of 1944. In that election, Ike was running for a fourth term. Um, Republicans. Roosevelt was running. I, excuse me. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Roosevelt was running for a, uh, a fourth term. Um, and um, Republicans, um, many Republicans were very angry over the soldier voting effort, which would, uh, and, and it's Southern Democrat, because they were concerned soldiers were going to vote for Ike in large numbers. Roosevelt. <laughs> Roosevelt. <laughs> Sorry. And also, Southern Democrats opposed um, the election effort because they saw it as a way of getting black soldiers the right vote to vote. For the first time, yeah. um, that was a, a very thorny, difficult battle in Congress, and Bobby was at the forefront of that battle. Secretary of War Stimson was extremely grateful for his handling of that matter. This is uh, Bobby and Ike in the campaign train, 1952. You can see a nice supply of cigarettes over here. Um, Ike, of course, had a heart attack a few years later. Um, uh, those things probably contributed, surely did. Um, this is Ike and Mamie and Bobby coming down. In a gay mood, says the guy. <laughs> it does say that. <laughs> uh, that's at Columbia, by the way. Charles, do you recognize that? You went to Columbia, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. It's uh, St. Paul's Chapel. I don't know. Does that make sense to you? Uh, yes, I don't know yes, Columbia well enough to yes, know that. Yes, yes. Anyway. Um, when Eisenhower was president of Columbia, briefly. He was. And, and, and he had an apartment in Morningside Heights, uh, which he maintained during the campaign. And so they would go back to New York during the campaign. And um, they regularly, Bobby regularly accustomed, accompanied them to church. And you can see that um, they had a very jovial relationship. And Bobby was known for his sense of humor. He was a raconteur. He was a teller of body and funny tales. And um, Ike and Mamie both enjoyed his company tremendously. Ike and Bobby over a stack of papers again, again during the campaign. It is the closing days of the campaign of 1952. That's Harvard Square, if you can believe it. That raucous, rowdy crowd. Um, uh, the students ripped items off the, the vehicle here as mementos. Here you have Bobby, and this is Christian Herter on the left, and I candidate in the middle, of course. After the campaign, this is in Quantico, Virginia. Uh, you have Bobby on the right, Attorney General Herbert Brownell, Secretary of Defense Charles Wilson, uh, George Humphrey, um, Secretary of Commerce, and um, um, Mr. Dodge, uh, Secretary, or uh, Director of the Budget. Um, evidently, Bobby is holding forth, holding court. Uh, 
And this, by the way, <laughs> just to go back for a second, this is a photograph from an article that appeared in the Saturday Evening Post um, under the title, <clears throat> Mystery Man of the White House, um, which is sort of gave rise to the title of the book. This is a photograph of Bobby. He, was a, he loved biking and biked hundreds of miles a year. This is um, <clears throat> intriguing to me. This is from his own autobiography. It was published in 1965. He says, the caption says, RC cycling beside the Potomac, December 3, 1953. This photograph hung in the White House near the small door to President Eisenhower's Oval Office with a caption, it's not young Lochinvar, of course, but Bobby on his iron horse. <laughs> um, Lochinvar is a character from Sir Walter Scott. Um, what's intriguing to me about this is this is December 3, 1953. So we're in the closing days of Ike's first year as president and is right at the most intense time over removal of J. Robert Oppenheimer. Um, on this day, Bobby is uh, dealing with J. Edgar Hoover and, and Attorney General Brownell, and they're trying to figure out how to sever Oppenheimer from his role in the nuclear weapons program. Um, information has come forward suggesting once again that Oppenheimer's a communist, and Ike insists or believes that in fact they can't take the risk anymore that he is, or it's suggested that McCarthy will figure out or will make a case of it that he is and that uh, Ike has turned a blind eye to it. So he tells Bobby to tell Hoover and Brownell what they're gonna do and they devise a plan. And others are involved too, of course. There's many people involved. It's a large effort, but it's right in the heat of that moment, that very day <laughs> this picture is taken. It's just a remarkably ironic. This is Steve, um, Steve Benedict, uh, the young man from the campaign train and uh, former lover of Skip Coons. Here's uh, him in southern France in about 1951. And a few years later, in his, um, uh, in his White House directory uh, uh, listing. Uh, I've, uh, actually, one of the amazing things is that Steve actually was made um, uh, White House security officer during the Eisenhower, uh, sorry, excuse me, the Army McCarthy hearings of 1954. Yeah, and it, it, incredibly tense, tense time. Um, and and if, if McCarthy had ever known that a gay man was the White House security officer, <laughs> it just would have been over. The roof would have blown off the place, but he never figured it out. Here's Skip in his Navy uniform, Skip Coons, um, the young naval intelligence operative. Um, and this is an operation um, when Skip um, went on a U.S. Navy vessel to Dairen, China in December of 1946 and served as interpreter for the U.S. forces. He's right here. Looking quite dashing, I must say. Um, <clears throat> and uh, he was the only interpreter for the U.S. forces, and, and the Soviets gave the, the vessel 48 hours to stay in port. And as the time began ticking down, a Soviet officer came on board and began uttering and gesticulating commands as Skip translated. The vessel quickly departed, um, uh, and this became a front page story of the New York Times that the, the Soviets had ordered the Americans to leave Dairen, China, which was supposed to be an open city under the terms of the Yalta Accords. So this is a very early conflict in the Cold War and Skip was really <laughs> at the fulcrum of this clash, if you can imagine that, between these forces. Uh, just, uh, this picture actually was taken by a life photographer um, who was permitted to go on the vessel by um, the admiral who, who set up this, this voyage and um, specifically asked Skip to go on it. Um, the picture never was published by Life because the, the Truman administration blew up and they didn't want any more stories because it blew up into a huge matter. The, the Soviets denied that an ultimatum was issued. 
Truman denied that an ultimatum was issued. <laughs> um, but um, the story was out there that it was, and it was from the front page of the New York Times. Um, the T New York Times and Time Magazine took the Truman administration to task for yielding too quickly to the Soviets. as a, a little known episode of the Cold War. This is uh, Skip in his black convertible right here, and his, uh, excuse me, I'm so sorry, and his um, lover, Gaylord Hofteiser, and that is his real name, right there. He's a gay car. <laughs> and uh, this, is, this is the house that they lived in Alexandria, Virginia. It is called the Dr. Dick House. <laughs> that is not, that's, that's for real. Um, it's not a joke. It, it was owned by Dr. Elisha Cullen Dick, who actually um, ministered to President Washington on his deathbed. Um, uh, this is Bobby and Skip. So we spoke about Bobby falling in love, head over heels in love uh, with Skip in the summer of 57. This is in the summer of 57 at a place called um, Dumbarton Oaks in Washington. It's a beautiful estate. It's currently owned by Harvard University. And this is the pool. Um, Bobby, I guess, had some long affiliation with Harvard, of course, and uh, somehow got the uh, ability to swim there with Skip that day. This is a photograph that emerged from Steve's files again. I was just astonished to find this when, it, when I first saw it. I just couldn't believe it. Um, and um, to finally find the pool and find the location was its own little adventure. <laughs> but um, the, uh, later in his diary, Bobby describes dreaming of Skip, um, golden and tanned in, at the pool at Dumbarton. So he, he himself, Bobby himself, will reminisce over this image as, as his relationship with Skip evolves. So in May of 58, and we're getting toward the end, I promise. I'm sorry to be going so long. But in May of 58, Bobby, when he's still national, in, in, at the end of his National Security Advisor term, he goes to Venice with Skip. And this is taken in St. Mark's Square. And Bobby will eventually tape this into the diary. So this is actually from the diary. And this is a postcard that after Bobby's left the White House, he writes this postcard to Ike. <laughs> he travels to France with Skip. And it says, August 23, Dear Mr. President, Skip and I drove over in his car to see these areas of your great landings and to pay our respects. So he's gone to the US military cemetery um, in France, in Normandy. Um, it is very impressive and interesting that the large crowds of visitors on Saturday were mostly French, yours, Bobby. So there's a couple intriguing things about this. First, of course, is he just introduced Skip, right? Now, the Ike would re probably remember Skip, who had left the National Security Council staff a few years ago. It does kind of raise a question about how much Ike actually knew about Bobby's feelings for Skip. Um, and then there's the, of course, the, the address is funny, right? The president, the White House, Washington, D.C. It got there somehow because this is at the Eisenhower Library now. But um, <clears throat> this is the postcard he chose to send him. <laughs> I, I, <laughs> this is a beautiful piece of art, this at, centerpiece of the, of the museum. It's a lovely piece. It's slightly homoerotic. I'm just going to say it. Um, <laughs> It's called, um, the, I think, the Spirit of American Youth, uh, American Youth Rising in the Waves um, by an American sculptor. But uh, <laughs> I don't know what, what message he was sending the president. But, um, <clears throat> eventually, Bobby gets skipped to come back to Boston, gets him a job at First National Bank of Boston, and buys him a sailboat, of course. And here they are on the boat. Bobby goes through a torrent of agony. Um, he can never get enough love from Skip. It is a story of unrequited love. It is painful, but it is universal. It's a universal human experience. You don't have to be gay to have unrequited love. And so he leaves Boston, and he says, I need to go back to work, and I'm going to go 
to work for the man I respect most, and that's President Eisenhower. So he goes back, Ike makes him the first director of the Inter-American Development Bank. This is a bank, because Ike's brother Milton believed fervently that the lack of development in Latin America was leading to radical movements and a com very serious communist threat in Latin America. And so what we needed to do was foster development in Latin America. Imagine that approach. How radical is that, huh? <laughs> Instead of pulling out resources, you put in resources to try to solve problems. So Bobby became the first executive director of that bank, and he served in that position uh, two years into the Kennedy administration. John Kennedy uh, met with Bobby and liked Bobby. This is the hero of the story, Steve Benedict, who preserved the diaries, and, and there they are, gave them to me. This is the hand handmade leather carrying case that Bobby made to hold the diary, in, in which he gave the diary to Skip in uh, 1969. And that's the book title. Thank you very much. <laughs>